All right, welcome back everybody. This is Resilient Voices and Beyond. I'm so excited. This is season two and this is episode two of season two. Um, so, wow. It's been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming and I just think about it um, and I could not be here without you guys listening, um, offering your um, criticism, advice, and and how to move forward. You know, some of you guys have threw some topics my way that I plan to have on season two, um, but thank you, you know, and I can't thank you enough, but thank you guys for being here with me. Um, this episode is going to be very awesome. Um, I have um, my brother here, a good friend, um, colleague, um, and I'm really excited to take you guys along his journey. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to have him introduce himself. Uh, well, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Joshua Christian Oswald. Um, uh, I'd like to just begin with saying, Michael, thanks so much for all that you do and how many voices you lift up, you know, uh, I, I'm a strong believer in a collective voice matters, and you truly demonstrate that throughout your podcast. And season one was awesome, and I'm sure this one will be even awesomer. And just can't wait to continue to see how many people become on become intertwined with your journey. Um, but uh, like I was saying, my name is uh, Joshua Christian Oswald, and I am an alumni of the foster care system. And today, uh, I work as a Policy Coordinator at IARCA, the Indiana Children, uh, Family, and Advocacy team here in Indiana. And basically, um, we just, uh, we have about a uh, hundred agencies we uh, advocate for, and we just gear towards improving your services. It's a lot of fun. It's a little complex because there's a lot of topical focuses <laughs> across the agencies. Um, but I am just truly happy where I am today as a young adult and 25, and I'm a Hoosier. I'm from Indiana. Uh, I'm a good, uh, I'm a good big fan of Indiana, I, I guess I could say. And um, yeah, I say that in all my speeches. People get, some people don't like it though, uh, depending on where they're at. I don't know what's up with Chicago, but they, they always like get on to me or joke with me. So anyways, thanks so much, Michael, for having me. Awesome. Awesome. It's truly a pleasure. Um, yeah, man, uh, I, I've known you for a while. I didn't know we were the same age, um, so that's awesome as well. So um, I'm pretty sure this year of your life has been um, a chapter in itself. Um, but um, getting right into it, you know, um, my first question to you is, um, when did this all begin to you? When did your experience in the foster care system start to whatever deep, um, whatever depths that you want to explain? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, my foster care experience began at the age of two. Um, you know, there were some substance abuse problems and just poverty problems that really tied back to my biological family. You know, I think more than 60% of families lose their kids due to the consequences of poverty. And if we as a community would step up and help meet those needs, you know, it, problems wouldn't lead to substance abuse. So they wouldn't lead to uh, neglect. Um, of, and however, that's defined by one state. And so, um, you know, for me, yeah, there was just, it was a lot of poverty and it led in substance abuse, a lot of like crazy, terrible guys, like in my biological mother's like life and really just took advantage of her. And uh, so one day, um, you know, I can't quite remember uh, as a two-year-old reflecting back, <clears throat> reflecting back, but um, I, I knew I was removed and put into the system, um, and I stayed in care for about 18 years, 18 homes. Um, the first few years of my life, um, I was in and out. Um, I typically, uh, I was, when I was out of foster care, and I'd go back to be reunified with my biological mother. Um, it would be like for a month or two at a time. So it really just wasn't. Um, so I typically tell folks I was in care for about 18 years and 18 homes. But yeah, that's that's kind of where it started. Wow, you, you hit on something there that um, 
reunification for a while was, you know, um, a big part, you know, so you would go, you would be in the system, um, and I'm assuming, I'm assuming, and so your mom would get her stuff together to a certain extent where they felt that reunification was possible and they would bring you back home. Um, what, um, because, you know, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but how did that impact you, trauma or mental health wise, like, as at when you got to the point of recollecting that, you know? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I would, I'll gladly try to answer it. Um, uh, you know, when I was just kind of lingering from home to home as a young little kid, I think until like the age of five or six, I started really acknowledging like life and articulating life. Maybe not like as a young adult, but I like knew life, I knew how to eat, it was potty trained, all those, all those basic things you need to know. Um, and so um, I remember I was a mama's boy back then and uh, still am with my, with my adopted family today. I'll tell you about a little later, um, but it really affected me big time. Um, I used um, all my thir 13 birthday wishes uh, up to the age of 13 to go back to a place that um, was an unhealthy home for me. Um, you know, at that time period, Michael, there really wasn't like services in play and still a little today, as I'm sure you already know, that um, geared towards creating that healthy infrastructure back with biological families. So for me and my experience in the timeline, it wasn't healthy, but I also didn't have a sense of identity from moving so much, but I just kept getting hurt. And I just kept telling myself, I really want to go to this place, people, my peers around me called home, which is your biological family. So it hurt a lot, a lot of tears, a lot of crying, a lot of anger, definitely had a lot of anger. Um, and my mental health was just, you know, I, I guess I didn't even, as I got older, I would, I was in about nine years of therapy, but as I got older, I started to discover these things like, wow, like I really need to work through some of this trauma and figure out what was happening to me. And, you know, I think it was just because the word adoption kept being told for me that was best, never really explained to me, never really explained like permanency options at such a young age. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the fact that I really didn't know as much as I had liked to know about my biological family, it was like it was some type of crime to know <laughs> to know about your family and your culture and where you come from. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all those things were not really answered. So I, I always had a wondering mind and was just like, yeah, that's, that's, that's my goal. That's where I need to be. That's where I need to know. Wow. Hmm. So I, I kind of want to go back to what you said a little bit earlier, you know, excuse me if I'm bouncing around, my mind is kind of crazy like that. I love it. I love it. Um, but in um, your, your earlier um, part of your story, you talked about the importance of services and resources in prevention and family preservation, you know, um, and, you know, from my experience growing up from, um, uh, Detroit, Michigan, which is known to be a very urban and um, poverty-written area in um, America. Um, not all of it, so don't nobody get offended. Not all of it, but where I grew up, it was that way. <laughs> but um, you see a lot of uh, what I call side effects of life. Um, and I know it's different from everyone else, but substance abuse in my growing up was a side effect of life being hard and people trying to cope, you know, um, and, 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 and along with other things. So when we talk about prevention and preservation services, what do you believe now versus, you know, your experience going through that would have been helpful for your mom, you know, uh, would have been beneficial? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great point you make. You know, my biological mom grew up, uh, well, uh, it's still located and located back then um, on the east side of Indy, Indianapolis, and it's uh, kind of a poverty-ish area. There's a lot of gangs around her and just any number of um, 
really just factors in the community that are not helpful to her getting on her feet. Um, but I believe if somebody could have paid for a bill or food, there are many times where I didn't have food. Um, I remember my one of my sisters, I'm the, I'm the youngest out of six, and uh, one of my sisters would always try to like feed me and kind of care for me. And, you know, I think if there would have been somebody in there, like a specialist of some sort that was willing to work with her about positive relationships, I feel like oftentimes folks in poverty um, feel like I really don't know how to get out of unhealthy relationships and feel such a connection there with the little relational permanency they may have that they may stay in it. But I mean, even transportation, um, treatment, like for substance abuse today, I mean, yes, there are services and substance abuse places out there or just family parenting classes, uh, but I don't think it's enough. I think it's so little. And I think it's unfair when you think about the resources and services on the foster parent side. Um, you know, really, uh, it should just be gearing towards those needs and they could be individual. And, you know, so it could be, could be any number of little things to even big things, but even teaching how to budget, just going through like what, you know, you may not even learn in high school. Um, just like as if you were teaching a young person to transition into adulthood and all the things they may need to know. Uh, you know, maybe maybe folks in poverty or at least where my bio mom was at, like she probably could have really benefited from those things. Because today she actually has like the capacity uh, cognitively of like a first grader. And her speech is very blurred. And I'm just like, wow, if somebody would have intervened really early on helped with some bills, gave some food, the church would have stepped up, the state would have stepped up and, you know, talked about uh, parenting and positive parenting and relationships. Any number of things could have been different. Um, but I will say I'm very thankful for my forever family today and where, where I am. Um, but reflecting back, I think those things could have been helpful. Definitely, definitely. And I just want to comment towards what you were saying there. Um, when we think about changing child welfare to a prevention-based um, place, you know, preserving that family, we have to think about thinking outside of the box of what our norm is. And um, our norm is, well, kids in danger, we just put them in foster care or we allow them to be adopted, you know. Um, but also when we have been doing that for years on years, we have developed stigmas and labels. So when someone comes up with substance abuse or when someone comes up with neglect and, and, and it's not more so an intense or extreme case, you know, just a parent just that probably just needs some help, you know, they're faced with all that judgment and stigma. And then the person who's left to face those consequences is the parent as well, but more so the kid because the kid loses the opportunity to be with their parent at their best if they would have had the resources, you know, and what have you. So I, I definitely understand and recollect what you're saying. And I think, you know, as we continue to move forward, as child welfare continues to move forward to prevention and preservation with, you know, family first and what have you, um, we have to think about thinking outside of the box and how we can meet people's need or meet them where they're at, you know, um, and I think about programs like parent partners, you know, if, if an allegation comes up and it's not something that is an immediate removal or what have you, it's an investigation, why don't, connect, why don't you connect that parent who has the allegation with a parent partner to work with them to be able to develop skills or to be able to be in a better place? And they can tell tell you from experience of having the kids removed, like you're on the steps to getting your kids removed, you know, so let's help you get in a better place. Um, but that's my little tangent. That's my little rant. I want to- You're absolutely um, right. I totally agree with you. <laughs> definitely. Um, I want to um, kind of bounce a little bit ahead. Um, you said you have been in 18 homes. So I kind of want to um, ask you, what was your experience? And do you have any pros and cons about your experience being in these foster homes? You know, um, my experience really looked 
very it was very different in a lot of different placements. Um, I'd say, you know, my first from like six to 11 was my longest placement. And it was actually my worst placement I was ever in. It's crazy that I was in there the longest amount of time. Um, and they were very uh, neglectful uh, in probably more extreme ways than why I was actually removed and put into the system in the first place. Um, and, you know, I, you know, one day when I was 11, I ended up telling one of my friends what was going on in this placement. And um, I said, um, they had told me, they're like, if you don't tell the teacher, I'm done, the teacher. So, you know, I, I was just crying, tearing up, and I was like, you're right, you're right, all right, so I'm going to go tell the teacher. So I told the teacher and ended up, um, you know, um, I was crying, and I had a foster brother at that time that was kind of making fun of me for crying, and I was like, I, I, I don't know, we were just the same age, and we would fight a lot. That's what kids do, you know, and so um, later on that day, though, uh, they they came out, they removed us, and we transitioned to the next placement. And from there, um, you know, we were in a home where my brother uh, ended up getting adopted and having a failed adoption uh, later on in his life. Um, all my siblings, biological siblings, were adopted in different placements. And, and um, really early on, I think, if I, if I can remember back. And so um, we ended up transitioning again and again and again and again or at least I did, I had the placement at that time, you know, I really was traumatized at that point and really just trying to recover and figure out, okay, how do I begin taking some steps? And, you know, I think kids are kids, we're foster or not, you know, there's not really a bad kid, it's just a kid trying to figure out life. Um, and that label foster can be intimidating for a lot of foster parents and you know, I didn't like it when folks yelled. I, I still don't today, you know, like I, it, it can be traumatizing for me. I don't like it and it's triggersome. Um, so I said, hey, displacement yells a lot. Um, can we please, like I wanted to transition out. There would be times where, you know, folks were foster parents would smoke in their cars and I cover my mouth and I get in trouble for that. Just some silly stuff because it wasn't normal to them. But to me, it differed from my normalcy and it was uncomfortable. And so I tried to adjust. Um, and I think, you know, really from one placement to next, uh, when I was uh, 13, uh, they placed me in a juvenile detention center. Uh, that was uh, like a dual program for group homes and foster homes. Uh, I was in there because I didn't really, they didn't have a placement for me. There wasn't really a foster parent to take me in that time. So I was in there and, uh, that was the moment I really decided, okay, well, this word adoption, whatever that meant, um, just keeps coming back and hurting me and there keeps being placement disruptions. And sure, I did get in detentions and any number of things, uh, but it's, it's really tough to, you know, look at that and think about, you know, a foster parent telling the kid on the first day when they move in, hey, we're, we're never going to, uh, you're never going to have to leave this placement. But when things get a little tough and you get past that honeymoon stage and you start actually working through some stuff, sometimes, uh, in my experience, uh, the foster placements would um, would transition me on. Uh, and, you know, that promise would be broken. So when I was in that juvenile detention center, I decided, OK, I'm going to tell my judge that I'm going to age out of foster care. Uh, and there was going to be a placement that I would be adopted in. And then, you know, I, um, I went, I, when I began high school, uh, my education was like, it changed a lot wildly in content, structure, and capability. At first, um, started off with like seven classes a day, and then I transitioned to a school and an AB block schedule, and then I transitioned to another school with a tri-semester like, curriculum instead of two and having three. Um, and then my fourth placement in high school transition uh, to a new high school was back to seven classes a day. And to make matters worse, when you're in foster care, you don't really get the privilege to say, hey, I'm going to move during a holiday or I'm going to move uh, during a convenient time. So, um, you know, you have problems with credits transferring, you have problems with uh, getting accustomed to the new curriculum. There's just any number of adjustments in there. And, I definitely, um, 
I definitely struggled in school and I definitely gave folks um, <laughs> a hard time sometimes and I was really traumatized and uh, trying to get through therapy. Um, you know, I will say my um, sophomore year in high school, uh, I did meet one of the one of the pros here is uh, I met the man who changed my life forever. And his name is uh, Matthew Oswald. And Matthew was my case manager. He came in the door, shook my hand, and he didn't care really what was on the case file. He read it, he was knowledgeable of it, but he was there to just get to know me as a young person for who I was. And I appreciated that. And every every week, he didn't have to do this, but he'd drive an hour and a half to go take me to school, be at school by 7 a.m. It was crazy. <laughs> and then uh, we'd go to this gas station where we'd always have coffee and you know it was like a really special place for us that gas station and um so as i um continued to plan during through placements outside of the academic and how all that stuff kind of transitioned wildly um matt moved up in the company as a case manager and um he um he just stayed as a mentor for me and so I was in, I, I think my 17th placement and um, in this placement, I was like really just helping the a single parent foster mom care for some kids. There was six of us in the placement and I was the oldest. And, you know, one week before, uh, three weeks before I was 18, I remember there was a time um, where I, I had, uh, I, I got yelled at a lot in that placement. And it was like every single day. And one day I um, yelled back and I was really, I was really mad and disappointed in myself. And I called Matthew and I said, hey, um, I can't, uh, I'm just really sad. You know, I was, I was sad and disappointed in who I was because I didn't want to go to that kind of level. And so, um, you know, he was there for me and a week before I was 18, he calls me at 1030 at night and he's like, hey, bud, what are you doing? And I said, well, um, you know, I'm going to bed. What are you doing? And he asked me if I could transition <laughs> into his home. And so I, um, I, I basically kind of told him I would think about it because uh, I didn't want to lose the relational permanency there, long lasting, loving relationship. I felt like you know, every placement I was in, either I disrupted it or some some other factor did, and it just didn't work out. And I, I couldn't understand God's plan for me. And oh, and I failed to mention, Michael, um, I've been praying since I was four years old. Um, uh, back then, I was uh, locked into a closet and I just started praying, never, never stopped since then. And so I prayed about this decision and this conversation with Matthew at this point. And I, um, I called my brother and he told me how much I deserve the family and X, Y, and Z. And so I called Matthew back and I said, and I agreed to move in uh, so they could support me while I was transitioning into adulthood. And then, you know, I ended up, um, I ended up six months later, uh, sitting him down. And I said, hey, I talked to you guys. And they they were really nervous. They thought maybe I did something wrong at school or didn't really know what I was going to bring to their attention. Um, and, you know, for the first time in a long, long, long time, I was like, wow, I could really have a family thinking of myself. And so I asked them, um, I asked them if I can call them mom and dad. And, you know, that was a powerful label for me because I had given up on that as way back as a teenager, young teenager, and they were crying, and I was crying, and of course they said yes, um, so I ended up gaining my forever family, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how the, how the journey looks through my high school years. Wow, you know, it, we, we talk about resiliency and perseverance and um, foster care and um, even adoption a lot, you know, um, just trying to make it through, make it through the days, make it through the nights and, and what have you. And um, just thinking back, you know, and listening to your story, you know, um, wasn't a lot of hope, you know, you know, hope kind of like, 
left. And, you know, um, it was just always that glimmering light, you know, that kind of kept me going forward, you know, and um, to see that, you know, there was a happily ever after, you know, um, it's awesome. It's awesome. And it's very encouraging. Um, I kind of want to transition from the ever home to, to high school years to um, college, young adult life, and moving into advocacy. What did that look like for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll say before, before pivoting, um, you know, Michael, I think it, the hope for me was the community that wrapped around me in all these placements. And then more importantly, it was God. I never stopped yeah. praying. And, you know, my prayers were an answered in a different way, in a different timeline. It wasn't my timeline. It was his. And I'm really thankful today because of it. But um, entering into my kind of college years. So when I moved in with Matthew and his wife, Linda, um, and I called them mom and dad, um, I ended up excelling my senior year. I ended up becoming captain of my track team, my my uh, cross country team, and I broke a record in high school. I all out of the blue, never thought I was going to college, but out of the blue, I started getting scholarships for college. Um, and you know, when looking at college, I was really intentional because I went to I believe it's a a D ranked high school. Um, when uh, and it was a public one and uh, I had because of how much my education was skewed of all these transitions uh, when I was younger or even in high school like I was I was really at like a third grade level learning how to read and write in high school and when I was at the public school I thought I boosted up to like a sixth or seventh grade level level and so I decided I was going to go to a private school and when you're a foster kid and you're aging out and if you, you have the opportunity in most states to go to a public school for free and private school, not really so much for free. And so I was like, okay, if I'm going to make it through, I'm probably going to need that one-on-one -on -one attention. So I decided to take out some loans and use the scholarships I had and transition to a small little private school out in uh, Rensselaer, Rensselaer, Indiana called St. Joseph's College. Um, during this time, uh, you know, it was a it was a really interesting year, you know. I think the the one sibling I had growing up with me uh, um, consistently uh, was my brother at that point, and he had uh, some things happen and went to a coma in my freshman year, and I had to fly back and forth across the country to go take care of him as his second of kin because his adoption was failed, and I was the link connected to him and. Uh, you know, I ended up working with the college and the community there. It was so small. They wrapped around me. I'll be forever grateful for those people. And, you know, we, it just felt like I was loved and supported. Being an hour and a half away from my forever home, um, it was a little challenging. And so it, the love and support just went a long ways for me. And then all of a sudden, you know, we find out after Christmas time on my freshman year, the, the college was closing down. It uh, was so much in debt. And I was like, dang, can I ever stay anywhere more than a year? <laughs> you know? And so um, I we all looked at different schools and Marion University uh, told St. Joseph's College, hey, uh, if you're interested, um, we are willing to take any of your students and keep their academic uh, however much they're paying there, they'll pay the same amount here. Um, and so I chose the Marion University route, which was great for any number of reasons, for advocacy, for um, just simply having, not being able, having to worry about paying more, I guess. And it was 15 minutes away from my forever family. So that was also awesome too. I, during that time, I met, um, I met my girlfriend, Kristen, um, and, you know, we've been together for about six years now. Uh, time's getting real close <laughs> to a better, better journey, better stage in that, that kind of relationship. But, um, you know, I ended up, you know, no longer was I speaking for foster parents or, 
uh, during trainings or just doing so many speeches, I ended up just wanting a call to action. When my brother had passed and I went to Marion, I realized I was now in the city instead of a cornfield. And, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted, didn't really want to share my story to make people smile or cry. I wanted a call to action. So I really know how I do it, but I joined the local Indiana Youth Advisory Board and I ended up helping pushing with the first law was around extending Medicaid to 26 with automatic um, Medicaid enrollment annually. So you don't have to refill out paperwork or do any of those things. Um, and then it was to be able to obtain driver's license. So a young person could obtain their driver's license at 16 without having a foster parent have to uh, sign off on them or the, being able to allow the state to do that. And so that was, that was pretty cool. And you know, the extension of foster care. I think it was the group I first joined with you, actually, uh, the NE Casey Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. When I went out there to Baltimore, it was crazy because I remember a colleague of ours just talking about um, how they had, uh, and they, they give me permission to say this, but I won't mention any names, um, but how they, they weren't, they didn't have housing and they were pushing for extension of foster care in their state from ages 18 to 21 and voluntary services from 21 to 23 and it just broke my heart I was like man if, if they can be pushing for that I can too you know it's the least I could do and so I went back home to Indiana the good old Hoosier state and uh, I began pushing that and you know, we achieved our goals there. We also pushed some laws around the Every Student Succeed Act. My college time was awesome because during this process of all this advocacy, my professors were so flexible with me. I would tell them what's coming up, the event, and they would either uh, meet me after hours or extend timelines or just really try to empower me as a young person while uh, uh, supporting me a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of tutoring a nonstop, um, just meeting with them and learning the materials uh, to just make sure I also succeeded in my academic performance. Um, I was an RA in college, you know, I was trying to figure out how can I get free housing, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, if you become an RA, you know, you can get free housing. And, and I was like, okay, that's awesome. There's 10K right there, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to pay that. And it wasn't, and it wasn't that uh, hard of a job either. It was like I met, I met with them once every two weeks, and I, I just had like twelve or twelve to twenty six people on my floor, depending on like what floor I was on that year. And that was super fun. I started a coffee house. Uh, that was cool. I ended up working for a lobbying firm downtown. Uh, lot, lot to unpack here, but impact. I uh, helped. Marion actually implement um, a apprenticeship through their partnership with a new building that was called St. Joseph's College of Marion University. And the apprenticeship really geared towards folks who are in poverty or folks who uh, had experienced foster care and um, just really gave them a chance to go to private, private schools without having to pay that extra amount that, that I have to. Um, so that was super fun. And then, you know, it was just, I also was a salesman during my college years. I sold $28,000 worth of kitchen knives for Cutco Vector Marketing. I uh, joined a few different organizations. And yeah, let me just pause and see what you're thinking. That's a, that's a lot right there. That's you, you definitely, you dropped a lot of nuggets, you know, um, and, I, and I'm just, I'm just thinking, um, cause I wanna, I wanna go back a little bit, you know, cause you mentioned something, um, because I'm hearing a trend with, you know, your forever family, you know, um, with, with your mom and, and with your girlfriend. Um, how was that journey um, intertwining with all this and all these transition with relationships for you? Because I know for a lot of us um, that come from foster care, you know, or, you know, other pathways throughout the child welfare, we have something, and, and I don't want to, like, group us all together and say this, but relationships don't come easy, you know? <laughs> um, so um, how did you navigate that to to be where you are um, with those relationships? 
Great question. So, you know, for me, when I found my, when, when God brought me and my forever family together, you know, we weren't just, it wasn't just them uh, adopting me in a sense or me adopting them. And it was more so us coming together as one and both sides, like accepting the either party. And it wasn't hard at all. Um, they're so loving. And, you know, I think there was a time early on, I'm trying to remember a timeline in college where I said to them, I said, um, well, actually it was right before college. And I knew I had to work on some forgiveness and I knew I had, you know, had some troubling actions and things like that where I'd hurt some placements in my past too. And so I prayed to God and I decided to go back to every single one of those placements and either said, hey, I'm so sorry for what I had done to you and your family or or I went back and said, hey, um, I forgive you for what had happened to me or my siblings in your home. And that that led to the opportunity of me being able to forgive my forever, um, my dot, excuse me, my biological mother. I was really nervous uh, when talking to my mom and dad today, my forever family um, at that time, and because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. But I felt like in the timeline, I was like, okay, if I don't do this, you know, maybe there'll be, how do I know she'll be alive? Would I ever want to do this in my future? So I built up the courage and my forever family stood right with me and they supported me. And at this time, my girlfriend was in my life at that point too, Kristen. And so um, we went over there and, or I went over there and I made that, I made that first step. And then my forever family and I and my biological mom, we ended up going out to eat or something like that. And then for set, for about five to six years now, we have just been really caring for her, trying to step up and do what the state and church could not do. And, you know, it's it's been it's been a journey because with my biological mother, you know, I think I think a lot of foster youth or alums around us sometimes forget to set boundaries. And, you know, when you're nourishing the space with somebody who didn't have services that are still in some ways that maybe aren't so healthy, you got to set boundaries. You got to be healthy. You got to make sure that, you know, you're ready for however many times you're communicating with them. And it'll look different for everybody. But for me, it was, it was a lot to take in, especially at a capacity being at a first grade level. And so my uh, forever family and I, we, we wrapped around her. We helped her with different clothing things, sometimes with fans or just any number of needs she may have had. And my girlfriend was very supportive. It was interesting for her because, you know, when she first met me, I was like crying about like being scared to go back and take those steps. And then it eventually over the years became into a relationship where it was like, wow, like I'm introducing my girlfriend to this, this lady that I once, you know, had a lot of anger in my heart for it. Um, and so I think they've all come up to be, but and when it think when thinking about the foster care community and community growing up, um, I on September 20th, I was adopted. Uh, September 4th, 2020, I was adopted into the Oswald family. And because of how much community meant to me, I said, okay, well, I can't just be adopted with you know, just my forever family, because what it meant to our, my family to be in Oswald is we take in alumni, we take in community, anybody around us, you know, we believe in this thing called chosen family. And so uh, I told the course, I said, hey, you know, I'm so ready to be adopted into the Os Oswalds, but I got to have my alumni, foster and brother, sisters there with me. Um, but at this point, they were all across the country, right, in different national organizations. And so there was actually a conflict in the court where you couldn't do both in-person and virtual. I, I didn't understand why. So I called the former assistant secretary, and I said, hey, can you help me make this happen? So she she got a hold of somebody in Supreme Court or something like that. And then, um, you know, on my adoption day, you know, I had my chosen family, I had my lunch ladies that used to come in like, hey, baby, how you doing? Or my coaches. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's about a total of 150 on there that was adopted uh, as my chosen family adopted with me into my 
to the Oswalds. And that's that's when I became an Oswald. And that's how all those relationships and community kind of played a role in my life. And um, I'm really proud to be an Oswald today. I, I love that, you know, um, and and I love that throughout your journey, there were people that were consistent, they were constant, you know, and you remembered those people and they followed you throughout your journey to finding your forever family. And um, I love that that became your village, you know, um, and it's, be, it, it's just very beautiful to hear that. Um, wow, I, I hear when you're telling me your story, you know, just the strength and, and the power and, and advocacy, you know, and, and using your voice, you know, but also um, the strength behind uh, working through the place of healing, you know, um, and getting to that place of maybe understanding, accepting, you know, and then forgiving you know, um, how powerful forgiveness can be, you know, um, and I know you as a fellow Christian and, and what have you, um, that space for grace, you know, um, is, is very powerful in itself. Um, so I, I commend you on that. Um, right now, I kind of want to go back because I kind of took us to a whole other section go back to um, advocacy because I know you've done a mixture of national and um, uh, statewide um, advocacy. So I want to kind of, you know, get all that encompassed in there. I know you said it was a lot, but I want to get in, get in that to be, to be able to uplift all the work you have done, um, not just only in your state, but nationally. You've done a lot of work, you know, in working with different organizations and what have you. So if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, you know, for me, um, foster care was really lonely growing up. And then when I dove into advocacy, it was really purposeful and fulfilling. Uh, in the beginning, I it was a lot about me just because I was a little younger and, you know, excited and just wanted to, you know, share my voice and be heard for the first time. <clears throat> and you know, after uh, I, I had originally, after I joined the local advisory board and started pushing some legislation locally in my state, um, I, and then right after our first convening at the NEE Casey Foundation, we presented to Dr. Jerry Milner. At the time was the associate commissioner at the Children's Bill in DC. And I messaged him and I said, hey, hey, Jerry, it was so good meeting you. And, um, I'd love to learn from you. And I just really want to make sure that I can look back and say I impacted one person. And so I developed relationships with, with Jerry uh, for about three years. We, uh, like every other week, I was just learning and learning and learning uh, on our phone calls. And I appreciated the time and to somebody who was an elected official who saw the human and I could see the human in them and was willing to develop that relationship. There's a lot of power when you treat humans like humans. Um, 20, 2019, I joined the Senate Finance Committee uh, through a congressional internship through the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute. Um, that was super interesting for me. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I don't want to be a case manager. Uh, maybe I want to make more of a macro impact. Um, and even though I, I believe micro and that one-on-one -on -one impact is probably the most authentic uh, type of impact we can make. Um, but I felt like maybe I can make a broader one and plant some seeds for some of those uh, front frontline warriors out there fighting for the create a system that's child and family well-being like and so uh, as I transitioned through several different organizations I realized it wasn't really me it was we and so my entire goal was no longer just moving in me it was we but so my projects I would call alumni and I would say hey uh, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? Uh, there, I think there was about a total of um, nine or 10 national organizations I had ended up joining in my college years. And um, it all shot up to the goal of being at the Children's Bureau. Um, 
in DC. And I knew I wasn't the only voice that, that needed to be at the jail. So I brought in, uh, for what the funding allowed, could have, it would have been like a hundred or two. Uh, I brought 12 other alumni uh, onto the first time in history, Administration for Children and Families Youth Engagement Team. Um, I had the opportunity to lead that and develop it and facilitate it, uh, both in the Trump administration as well as the Biden administration. I think the best part about our work, Michael, is you know we have the most bipartisan field out in the out of all the topic topics in the world to advocate for, at least in the United States, because uh, the largest uh, caucus on Capitol Hill is the Adoption Caucus, where all these issues uh, flow right through. Uh, so, so I went over there and I was super excited. COVID definitely uh, threw a strain on some things, made everything a little bit more virtual. Like, but it was great. I got to be at Children's Bill and got to see what Jerry's job was. I was it, it really just kind of led from a conversation of me wanting to shadow him and see if maybe that's something I would want to shoot for one day. And so then it turned into this internship. Got to bring all these young uh, people with me and just a diversity of a team arranging through all throughout the country in 12 different states. And I just felt very honored to be able to have the opportunity to lift those voices up. And I believe folks like you and I, or others who have experienced foster care, they're direct consumers. And, you know, I think if there are gonna be decisions made off this child, made to the child welfare system for adjustments or improvements, we need to have foster care alumni at the table because they're direct consumers. Um, you know, I'm not gonna ask my uh, electric dude to go help me with whatever garbage problem I have, right? So, you know, it's just making sure you're asking for whatever the focus is, the direct consumer. It just makes sense to ask those who lived it. So we have a unique experience. We get to see the system from the bottom up and, um, you know, that, that was really cool. And, you know, as I transitioned to the next administration, I got to really focus more in with the career staff. Um, and that was really interesting, too, um, because then I got to learn a lot of the nuts and bolts. If I were to do it again, I think I would have picked the career staff first and then, then the official leadership. Uh, so I could have had more knowledge, maybe, you know, but I will forever be grateful for the opportunity. Transitioning now, um, former Assistant Secretary Lynn Johnson, uh, I've been able to help her launch a nonprofit called All In Fostering Futures, where young people like you and I can go to retreats for healing and for opportunities to connect with other alumni and develop uh, relational permanency and chosen family, should that be what they want. And from there, you know, recently in the past year, I've transitioned to this new role with IARCA and um, I'm really able to, I'm hope, uh, you know, I'm only a couple months in, but I'm hopeful and thinking maybe I'll be able to make a big impact here, or at least a small one and um, bring others along with me. So this whole journey, I think it really, it really is purposeful and meaningful and I think it got really meaningful when I started thinking about we instead of me. And that feels, that feels good and that feels purposeful and feels like, you know, we're a team um yeah <laughs> yeah so that's that's kind of a little bit about my advocacy journey it's a little there's a lot there to unpack I know a lot of my story doesn't really align in some order but I think that's natural for anyone who's been in care you know it's not like an ABC thing it's more of like a time block thing definitely um I I, I really appreciate you know, you sharing your story um, openly and vulnerably um, to me and, and to the audience, you know, um, I feel like, you know, you hit on a lot of different things um, that is needed now for people to understand. I, I think, you know, um, the subject between, you know, um, birth, birth parents and uh, forever families and what have you understanding that um, because I know I have a lot of people um, that tune in that are you know fostering and, and adopting you know some uh, trainers who uh, facilitate that and license that so I think it's helpful to be able to see 
from our lens, you know, the, the, the child's lens, you know, the young adult's lens. Um, what did that look like? What did that experience look like? And how um, those um, stakeholders, you know, um, can help facilitate a healthy future, you know, for those individuals. But also um, speaking upon relationships, you know, um, which is a topic in itself that could be talked about forever uh, with us, but um, just your um, talking about that from your experience and your lens and how you navigated that, um, but also how you navigated college uh, was, it, it stood out to me a lot because um, I think about my personal journey and when I first got to college, um, I aged out of independent living. Um, I'd been in so many different places before that, but I aged out of the system from independent living successfully. And there was no real plan as far as housing or anything um, because I applied for Section 8 in my state or what have you. So the only way I saw my way being able to afford anything, you know, um, I had to go to college, you know, and I really didn't grasp the importance of college. Um, so when I got there, it was really all about getting the refund to be able to pay for a living. You know, um, I, I, I really didn't have a village. I didn't surround myself and encompass myself with a support team. Um, so I eventually ended up dropping out and that created like a domino effect in my life, getting into the working world, trying to continue to continue on my own. And I didn't see the value of village or relationships or community um, until I tried again. But um, when I tried again, it came um, for me, God had taught me a lesson about humility and uh, being humble. Um, I had got to a place where I was homeless in a Christian shelter. And it was very funny when I was homeless in this Christian shelter. I had been through so much before getting to that shelter, um, having to start completely over, losing everything that I had bought, you know, not really having a dime to my name. And um, I experienced peace <laughs> in the midst of nothingness and chaos and, and and stuff like that. I experienced peace. And I remember just like this, having that moment of like, this won't be, you know, like this won't be the end for me, you know? Um, you know, cause you know, we recently had this conversation when we were in DC with Knighted um, that um, for me, I was still advocating out of that shelter. You know, I was still going to like NFYI, United and doing all these things like, you know, and um, out of the shelter. But um, in that time, I, I remember that um, I had to decide to um, let go of a lot of stuff. And it was kind of like spring or I think of a wildfire. You know, it burns and, and and it destroys everything, but it's also beautiful in its own right because when that wildfire springs, you know, for those trees um, and those seeds, you know, they blossom after the wildfire, they bloom and they get caught up by the wind and get spreaded everywhere. So years later, you know, seasons after, um, you have a new forest, you know? And I think about that moment for me, like, there was a lot of things I was still holding on to, you know. Um, there was a lot of masks that I was still wearing. Um, I, I had, don't get me wrong, I had healed from a lot of stuff, but there was a lot of stuff that I didn't believe my own stuff stank, you know. <laughs> so I had to go through a moment where I was set there uh, with that stuff and become very humble and understand humility. And it was from that moment on that I realized this work in advocacy and this work that we do. I'm not doing it for myself. You know, I feel called to do this. And I, I talk a lot and I tell people that this is my ministry that God has put me on. You know, um, this is my purpose. And to really hear your journey, you know, it's just a reminder of those moments for me and really being set into my purpose. So I want to thank you for that. Um, my last couple of questions for you is... Um, well, not really a question, it's more so a statement from you. Um, 
what advice would you like to give? You can give this to any specific group of people or specific groups of people or in general, what advice would you like to leave with us today? Well, um, I'll start off by saying, Michael, thanks so much for sharing that piece with me. I, you know, it's it's great to remember different milestones that, you know, even your experience is how it, it aligns with mine. Um, I think, you know, you, you ought to be really proud of yourself and, you know, you've lifted up so many voices and that's such an awesome thing to do, um, especially directly and especially through the podcast and many other things um, and groups and uh, national initiatives. Um, uh, in, ter in terms of advice, and, I, and honestly, I think it aligns with both of yours and mine's um, uh, story and, you know, we may fail a thousand times, but if you have a mindset and you have faith and you want to go get something and go get it, go achieve your, achieve your dreams and, you know, make it happen because, you know, just like the quote, uh, if not you, then who, and if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? And, you know, um, I think, I think that's key. Uh, I also throw on a couple values of advice. Um, you know, I try to carry with me in all my spaces that I think I think everybody should, in my personal opinion. And that's to always have a positive attitude, uh, always have a strong work ethic, and always remain in or become, if you're not already, in a coachable space from those who are younger than you, same age as you, older than you. There's always something to learn everywhere. And um, you know, and if you value that, you know, folks will wrap around you and they'll see, they'll, they'll hear the value and you will they'll just cultivate that relationship and be able to move forward um, in whatever it is you that are trying to pursue in your heart. So go get it. I mean, have faith and know that it isn't a straight path to success. It's going to be a thousand curveballs, one after another. And um you know, you can, you can do it and you just got to believe that you can do it. And uh, the Bible says you just need a, a faith, a size of a muscle, mustard seed uh, to do anything in Christ who strengthens us. So thank you so much, Michael, for having me on today and uh, lifting up uh, my voice. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, uh, others as well. And um, you know, I, I'm excited to listen to your series as it continues on through um, season two. Definitely, definitely. I appreciate that. Um, appreciate your wisdom and um, your experience on today. You know, um, lastly, is there any comments you want to leave? And typically in this section, um, if you got an album, if you got a rap song, if you, whatever you about to drop or any way that people can stay connected with you or if you're open to it, people can connect with you. Um, if you would like to share that now, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. You know, typically if folks want to connect with me, um, you know, I encourage them to either reach out to my LinkedIn where my name is Joshua Christian Oswald there or my Facebook. Uh, definitely my Facebook is where I more so will post the most. I also have Instagram and LinkedIn and a, bunch, a few other things, but the main ones I would say, if you wanted to reach out to me and, you know, it's not so much timely, LinkedIn would probably uh, be a good area, but if it's really timely, definitely shoot me a message on Facebook. Um, you know, if you're interested in learning how to lift up youth engagement and institutionalize that in your agency or your state or your trainings um you know come talk to me and we can have a conversation or set up a contracting gig uh, if i can't help you i'm i'm sure i can connect you to someone else but um yeah that's those are those are the kind of platforms i'm on and different ways to reach out to me and um you know i'll get back to you in a timely manner Definitely. And there's one other thing I, I, I have to lift up here because there was just um, when I heard about it, I was just like, wow, um, you've recently, you know, um, put together a retreat. You know, um, if you mind sharing a little bit of why it um, what came about that, you know? Yeah. OK, great. Great idea. Yeah. So actually, um, 
late October, there's going to be another retreat going on. And it's an all-in Fraction and Futures co-ed retreat where alumni can, the retreats are now based regionally, but this one's particularly in Indiana and it's pulling from alumni in Indiana, uh, Illinois, and Michigan. And in between those three states, um, actually today we just finished up the final content and about ready to do some outreaching. So Michael, if you're free, you should come. <laughs> but um, uh, really, you know, the retreats came from this idea where alumni growing up didn't really always have the opportunity to spend the night at a friend's house or something like that because of nature being in the system. Kind of crazy, but also so, so true. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that that that's crazy thinking that you can't be a kid and spend that at your friend's house or something like that. Uh, so that's kind of how the idea kind of initiated. But then there was a few more layers there of like alumni who engage in this work in this field. You know, we need time to heal. We need time to connect, and we we need time to step away from the work and learn and develop skills and network with one another. Um, and so the retreat is really all geared about that. And of course, having fun. Um, I typically, uh, you know, I, I grow spiritually every single time. And I, I also have a lot of fun. And I also get to connect with alumni on a much deeper level than I, than I ever really have in some in an organization or that I'm going to see once or twice a year or a few times. It's just a lot more meaningful. And, you know, at the end, there's a candlelight ceremony that's really healing, too. That's a lot of fun. And this last time, I think we went out to the one before this. It was a men's retreat where men could be men that were alumni and be in the same space. And we had uh, any number of things ranging from quads, shooting rifles, going kayaking. I mean, and horses. I was on uh, a... Um, a cabin with 500 acres. It was it was just crazy awesome. Um, and the first one was uh, before that was um, in Colorado, and you know we went out to this ranch where it was just so beautiful. This lady who owns almost half the mountain out there, her name is Kathy Terba. She's she's so amazing, and um, you know alumni were able to go do activities out in the city, do roller coasters. There were spiritual moments. There was uh, moments for team bonding, trust speakers coming in this next one all the planning isn't really done for all the activities but you know um each time you try to grow bigger and better uh so we'll see what it has to come but if you're from one of those three states or you're interested in joining a retreat in general um reach out and i'll put you on the list for your region and we can talk about timelines and you know um especially especially if you're interested in healing and connecting with others so a lot of other professional and personal benefits to it, but those two, those two, I think would be the most meaningful for folks in the field, especially after the COVID era. Definitely, definitely. Um, thank you for you know dropping that in, and um, definitely shoot me that info because I'm I would love to be there. Um, I would love to be there. Um, as I get ready to end uh, this episode, I just want to say you know uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I hope that you were able to retain um, any amount of information um, from um, Joshua's uh, story and 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 just being able to you know listen in and really hear you know his experience. Also, I just want to be mindful because in these episodes I do dive deep, you know, and some of this stuff can be if if you experience trauma can be traumatic to yourself. So just being mindful, you know, um, after listening to this episode, you know, to just you know take care of yourself, you know, um, do some self care, you know, um, take a moment to you know do some breathing before you go do something else you know after receiving this but also if you know you feel you know this episode has came give you some charge giving you some energy you know because I know there's some social workers that listen to these episodes as well and it kind of boosts them up you know um don't let that energy just fall on you know um deaf ears or you know just fall to the ground you know take that energy and put it into your work today you know um or tomorrow whenever you listen to this you know and actually use it you know um it takes all of us to make this thing work you know um so let's just do it you know and other and other instances you know i i want to be i want to spread you know 
being safe. You know, COVID has slowed down a little bit, but we have monkey pox, you know, and if when the flu, cold and stuff like that. So just please make sure that you guys are being safe, you know, following protocols, you know, and, and, and whatever that uh, looks like in your state and in your life, you know, um, we can't just let, you know, what just happened through COVID just be like, oh, it just happened, it's over, you know, we still need to be safe and be healthy. It takes all of us to take care of, you know, um, us individually. So lastly, um, in my state of Michigan, um, there's going to be um, a summit coming up fairly soon. And as I get more information about it, I'm going to share it out on my social media. But uh, Michigan Children um, is going to be putting together a Children's Advocacy Summit. And um, it's going to be in honor of Michelle Corey, who um, unfortunately uh, passed. Um, and um, she was just a wonderful advocate. Um, she did a lot of work with um, me and with NFYI, Michigan Chapter, and with NFYI in general, um, but also did a lot of work of uplifting children's voices in the state of Michigan. Um, so just be looking out for that, you know, if you're interested in coming and being a part of that, um, we would love to have you. Um, as I get more information, I will share that. But until then, you guys have a good night, good morning, good evening, good whatever you are listening to this. This has been Resilient Voices and Beyond. Thank you.